Hello, my name is Peter Menden, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about our journey through creating model and component-based workflows for flight software development. I'll start by telling you a little bit about uh, our company, Bright Ascension. We are a space software company based in Scotland, offering innovative products and services. And uh, we've been going since 2011, but we launched our first mission, which was CubeSat in 2014. And since then, we've been involved in over 40 spacecraft between three and 50 kilograms using our software with quite a few more in development. And those are across a, a really wide range of applications. And we've worked with customers from uh, commercial through to agencies and on research projects across six continents and um, from single satellite missions through to constellations. Across this time, we found that uh, from experience, it's really important to consider the full context around flight software, not just the flight software itself, but where it needs to sit in terms of the overall system and uh, not just the end-to-end -end system from flight through to the delivery of whatever service is being provided, uh, whether that be a research or whether that be a commercial service, but also the development process, which is something which needs to continue even post-launch in most of the systems that we're working on. So in these situations, we've found that uh, software reuse is really, really important. And so we always need to strike a balance between bespoke mission-specific development and reuse of off-the-shelf software, which allows us to obviously reduce costs, reduce time to market, uh, and reduce risk, importantly. We've done that using a technology that we've developed called Generation One, um, and it combines three aspects. It combines a model-based approach where we capture the architecture of the software, not the behavioral model, but an architectural model of the software um, in a machine readable form. We build software out of software components, um, which, are, which are represented in the model, and all of the interactions between those software components are captured in terms of services, which are also captured in the model. And this gives us the benefits that we need in terms of being able to apply software um, and reuse software um, in a, in a fine-grained modular way and to be able to capture all of the way that the software has been constructed and used in a model so that that can be um, used throughout the system, not just within the flight software, but also within operation software and other parts of the system. So we apply this approach both to flight and ground software. The flight portion of this, we started off building for ourselves in order to create the CubeSat mission that we started with, and we evolved it into a product which we called the Flight Software Development Kit. And this provides all of the common functions for flight software as off-the-shelf software components, and it allows you to create mission-specific flight software by, by assembling these components um, within the glue, if you like, of the framework. The software can be tailored for the specific mission by choosing which components are going to get instantiated, how many of each type, how they get configured, how they get connected together, and create the creation of custom components um, is all supported by the tooling. So uh, creating and managing all of these components is quite easy, and that's the, one of the main emphasis uh, parts of the system to uh, allow software reuse. The model that's built is then used on flight in the flight software development process, but also the ground software. And the whole thing that we have shown to, that does reduce development time, cost and risk and helps get software available earlier, particularly to support things like payload development. So the workflow that we've got um, built into the FSDK uh, captures software component types within libraries. Um, and some of those software component types can be architecture specific. So we support a wide range of different architectures and supportability. Some component types are portable and some are not. Um, and then software images, which we call deployments, can be built from component instances. So component types are instantiated, connected together, configured, and so on to create these deployments. And then there's tooling to assist with this whole process. And our original focus was really on multiple lightweight tools 
um, a separate build system uh, with tooling that supported both code and documentation generation with a certain amount of IDE integration. So I'll take you through the workflow that we have been using for the past um, nearly 10 years um, as part of the FSDK. So you start out by defining a component type. So this is the interface to a component in an X short XML file. And the tooling allows you to generate skeleton code. Um, and then that you can then uh, implement your component type within that skeleton code. A lot of other component types exist in libraries. You can pull those in to create what we call a deployment, which is a flight software image, configure the instances, build it, deploy it onto your target. You can also generate documentation as well as what we call a spacecraft database, um, which is what goes into mission control software or the ground software. Um, component types are grouped together into libraries. You can generate documentation from those. And there's also integration with the unit testing framework. Um, called CMOC and Unity. So over the years, this whole system has evolved um, and it's involved in the context of real missions. So this has very much been an incremental development and we've gradually added flexibility and gradually added tooling complexity and the build system and tooling have developed almost on separate paths. We applied this, we've applied this to a lot of missions. Our customers have applied it to a lot of missions. We've all learned a lot along the way. And we felt that now was the time to reflect and to make some changes that are maybe not quite so incremental um, and to, to take this opportunity to address some of the major pain points that we've met along the way. So a major pain point is that the incremental way that the system has evolved is that the workflow is not always super clear and the lack, there's a, a lack of clarity around the, the responsibility split um, between the different aspects of what as a developer you interact with, tooling, build system and so on. We have built up a really solid conceptual understanding of our model-based, component-based and service-oriented system and the workflow is not very well coupled to that at the moment, uh, meaning that the, the conceptual aspect of the workflow is not as consistent as the way that we understand everything else. We're increasingly applying and our customers are increasingly applying what we're doing to complex systems. So large scale distributed systems, large teams, um, partial missions, so when uh, developers may be working on, say, a cluster within a constellation, and also products where the life cycle of what you're working on is completely decoupled from the life cycle of the mission where it might be applied. Um, versioning is really important. So we need to capture the idea that there might be different versions of uh, software component types, for example, coexisting in a system because systems evolve over time, and ground software particularly needs to be able to accommodate that. During development though, developers need to use a, a version control system such as Git. And so being able to square that circle of model managed version control and version control systems uh, is a little tricky. The way that the code base is organized is really important in terms of uh, making sure that the system is easy to understand, easy to use, easy to learn, and easy to manage things like IP divisions. So software which is provided to a developer versus software that the developer is, is developing themselves. Uh, I mentioned that we evolved the build system and the tooling separately. And so that I think is, is definitely a pain point um, as is the way the build system and to a certain extent the tooling handle the portability and the multi-architecture builds that we've built in. And then uh, I guess as is natural in uh, systems which have evolved, there are now quite a few special cases in the way that uh, everything has gone together. So I would say just to kind of sum up the main things that we're looking for um, in an improved workflow is we're especially looking for clarity, which really helps with the learning curve, expressivity, being able to say what you want, flexibility to adapt to a wide range of missions and speed, get up and running very quickly um, and to make the reuse as painless as possible. And particularly for us, we don't need to be able to fit this within a wider model-based approach 
covering much more of the development lifecycle, but also the end-to-end -end operational system. So our new workflow, trying to learn the lessons from uh, what we've been through, uh, is entirely tool-driven from a, from a single tool interface with very clear workflow steps, which we've linked back to all of the conceptual framework that we've build, been building up in generation one. There are new steps to explicitly capture some aspects which were really implied by the previous uh, workflow. So we were able to bring those out and the, the tooling can now assist with those in ways that it hasn't been able to, but also though making those steps explicit uh, makes the whole workflow a lot clearer. We're considering the whole mission and the previous workflow was really based around the individual deployments, creating individual software images. And now we're considering the whole mission and that's particularly to be able to tackle distributed systems and uh, multi-computer spacecraft um, in a straightforward way. And we focus very hard on trying to accommodate interactions with version control systems so that it's very clear who is doing versioning at any given time, whether that's version information captured in the model or version information captured in a VCS. So I'll take you through the various aspects of what we've been doing. The first is that we've added some extensions to our underlying meta model. Um, the most important of those is around modeling of the physical system. And this allows us to capture uh, an understanding of all of the computers in the system, all of the different software images, how those relate to spacecraft and how they relate to each other. We've increased the expressiveness in uh, component interfaces and in services. And a major part of that is actually in reducing special cases by increasing what you can express on a component interface or within a service allows us to bring into the fold some of the special cases that we had previously, um, now that we have a really good understanding of what is actually the general case. Particularly having the physical model allows us to define a mission and to capture all of the different uh, aspects of that, different satellites, what we call assets, and to be able to reason about distributed systems for the creation of software and also for the creation of things like documentation. So a mission is now our universe, and that means that uh, we can do things like identify our assignment within the context um, of a mission and know that it's going to be unique. Um, we are exploring the concept of compositional missions, which allows us to reuse mission fragments. We've now introduced the concept of a workspace, which turns out to be really important, especially with relationship to versioning, which I'll come back to in a moment. A workspace contains libraries which hold all the model types, so not just component types, but now we have the, the idea of deployment types and also physical types. And there's a few other things that we've introduced to make uh, steps in the workflow more explicit. A workflow can also a workspace, sorry, can also contain a mission. And workspaces, importantly, are the unit of packaging for code exchange. So this is where um, to allow the, the sharing of code, perhaps between members of a team or from one team or one organization to another. And that means that workspaces are also the unit of dependency. All builds take place within the, the workspace that, that you're using. So within your active workspace or the mission workspace, and so there is no, there are no, there's no code being built. There's no build artifacts being placed into any other uh, location other than your current workspace, which means all of your dependencies are treated as read only, which helps with sharing code and so on. I promise I'd come back to versioning. So uh, when you're working within a workspace, uh, we treat that workspace as being managed by um, whatever version control system you're choosing to use. And uh, we turn that into an overall version system within the wider workflow by introducing a step where you need to export your workspace before it can be used by anything else. We export workspaces to what we call bundles, and that effectively snapshots the workspace. And at that point, it assigns a diversion number, um, which is incremented for each time that you do that. And that gives everything within your workspace the same version 
So you can't, if you need things to evolve on different tracks with different versions, then they would need to be in different workspaces. But this really avoids complex synchronization between model versioning and being able to keep things uh, in, in your model with version numbers and the version control system. So where the ver where the models are used elsewhere uh, in the end-to-end -end system, particularly in ground software, version information is captured as part of that. But this is where the version information arises. It's a relatively simple approach, but we think it, it's quite useful um, and it could probably be applied elsewhere. Within workspaces, we've spent a lot of time thinking about the, the file layout and way, the way that that reflects the underlying concepts um, of our Generation 1 technology. Um, and we've put a lot of thought into organizing that so that um, it makes it as clear and easy to understand and easy to learn as possible. There's a lot of uh, clear separation of files by role, particularly separating out uh, user-maintained and tool-maintained files. We've kept uh, the ability to work with uh, multiple platforms. Um, so this is different architectures, so different boards, different operating systems. But we've spent a bit of time understanding how those fit in conceptually. Um, on reflection, the, uh, the, the positioning of, of architectures in the previous system, in the FSDK was driven very much by the build system. And now we've more tightly integrated it with the build and the model um, now that it's more of a unified concept and a unified workflow. So we think that's going to add a lot to the clarity and maintainability um, of uh, multiple platforms. Talking of the build system, um, we have um, slimmed it down and provided as a single recommended way of running all of the steps um, with as much automation as we possibly can. But then we're aware that many of our customers have complex steps and that they need to insert into their workflow. And so we try to provide ways to break out or to hook in, um, particularly to support automated builds through continuous integration, continuous delivery and so on. We uh, permit uh, the definition of multiple builds and each of those can be configured separately. And for all of those, there's a very clear separation of source code and build artifacts. And we've reintegrated our unit testing framework. So the new development flow, I'll try and take you through it. Hopefully it'll make sense. Start out by creating a workspace. That's where you're going to do all your work. And within that, um, we are going to create a library that workspace um, can depend on external bundles. Um, and within the library, we can create model types such as component types, but other, but also other things like um, physical system types, so subsystem types and asset types, as we call them. Where component types are created, you can implement those, and that's in C. Uh, and again, that's tool assisted, so uh, the tooling can generate uh, skeleton code, which you can then implement. You can also define deployment types, which is essentially assemblies um, of component type, component instances um, that are the basis for a system. You can then export your workspace to a bundle, which is where the versioning is introduced. And then uh, that allows you to pull it in as a dependency into a mission workspace. So once we have a mission, uh, we can define the physical system and uh, instantiate a deployment onto the various computers and spacecraft within that physical system. That allows us to actually do a build, create some flight software. It also allows us to export the model, um, which is the equivalent of the, of the spacecraft database, now a mission database, to ground software and to uh, other model-based uh, software that might form part of your development life cycle. Release the flight software and off we go. So to try and bring this into a slightly broader context, um, hopefully in a way that's useful to others looking at um, particularly model-based and component-based flows, the biggest lesson that we took away from this was that it's important co to consider the wider workflow around software development. And as part of that, to consider all of the tools that are involved in that workflow and to understand the relationship between each of those. If it's not super clear to you when you're setting it out, it won't be clear to anybody else. Um, this quite simple concept of having these checkpoints 
to allow interaction between model versioning and version control systems is something that's been very important to us um, and we think is, is not particularly specific to our technology and so may be useful to others. A really important thread through all of this is, is conceptual consistency, which is a, a key way of meeting our clarity objective. Um, and that's particularly to reduce the learning curve, to improve maintainability, and to allow us to continue to evolve and iterate this system, but in a way that's unlikely to introduce issues again in the future. So this has been an evolutionary process for our flight software development kit, which then um, has brought us to the position where we've taken stock and learned a lot of lessons from applying it uh, on missions across 40 plus operational spacecraft. We found that there were a, uh, a few aspects within this workflow, which weren't just an issue for flight software development, but actually became a larger barrier to a wider model-based approach across flight and ground during all the aspects of development, but also across the end-to-end -end system from flight software through to service delivery. So the next steps for us um, is to build on this workflow and look at the integration with other products that we're building, um, particularly uh, around um, operations and service delivery software. And then also to take next steps in test automation, the slightly richer and better specified workflow that we have allows us to more explicitly support system and integration testing, which is something that we're looking forward to addressing in the coming months. Thank you very much for listening. If you've got any questions, I'd be very happy to take them. <laughs>